Hello my babies, welcome to Dreamland Orchard. The Dreamland you pick from the orchard is, the body of a little boy washes up on the beach every Friday morning. From the subreddit we all love to read before we go to sleep, no sleep. Submitted by Storyteller Ali. The same boy washed up from the ocean then, as he had done every Friday morning, for the past four years. The same one. As a lifeguard, it was my duty to ensure that the dignity of Blink's Sables Beach was maintained. So I did what I had done for the past four years. I marked the spot of the boy's death and sealed it off as per usual, and told onlookers to mind their business. They never saw what I saw. The face of the boy was the same. The same face, every single Friday. My name is Tahir. I've lived in Marseille, a city in France since I was 12 years old when I emigrated from Libya. I moved because inequality, oppression, destruction, hatred, suffering and every vice you can imagine ran rampant. Not only that, I was given the opportunity to move, by God. I was an orphan. I never knew who my mother or father was. I only knew that they threw me away on the streets. I had to fend for myself for as long as I've known. My earliest memory before yielding pitch black emptiness in my mind, is myself. I'm three years old, being abandoned in the cataclysmic and barren streets of Libya by two people, who I think are my parents. I don't know what their faces look like. Everything after that is a blur of images intertwined to form the person who I am today. I remember that I encountered an orphanage house, if you can call it that, with many other kids without families like me. They were subjected to the neglect of people who were supposed to love them, just like I was. And in all of us, that stirred a deeply rooted hatred within us. Towards ourselves for being considered unworthy of our parents' care. Towards our parents for considering us unworthy of their care. Myself? I held that hatred of my parents for most of my life, even when I made myself a better life, here in France. A part of me still held on to it today before I made myself let go of it. It was for my own benefit, and the benefit of someone close to me that I relaced hatred with forgiveness, and faith in forgiveness. It was a hot day one day, late January I believe. The woman who was in charge of the orphanage had a planned surprise for us. We were to immigrate to France with the help of smugglers. The woman said that this was an opportunity to become free people. To be educated and fed in a country as great as France was an opportunity she asked us not to turn down. It didn't take much to convince me. My heart was set on the object of my desires, my freedom. The other kids felt the same. Because every single one of those children and I were to journey to France with the help of those people smugglers. The journey was tough and taxing. Some of my roughest encounters with hardened and callous men took place during those days. But I wasn't treated as harshly compared to some of the other kids. No, I was even lucky. We were in transit on a shipping boat with conditions that were horrific. Corpses of previous migrants laid there. A room with harsh steel walls housed every single migrant. There were maybe 100 people there, or more. I recall one time, a little girl who looked about eight, had asked for some bread. This girl, she looked lethargic, with sunken eyes and a small forehead and tiny bite-sized fingers. Her bones were brittle and she resembled the corned figures you see on weight loss programs. Still, she went up to the men who proudly wielded batons and assault rifles, and asked if she could have some food. They responded with profanity and insults called her a dog, an insect-covered animal, a pile of animal stool in human form. They then beat her half to death, on the spot, for what seemed like an eternity. Until bruises and cuts protruded every pore and nook and cranny on her body. Her face was swollen and streaming with tears. She defiantly yelled I want to mum and dad. In a shrill, horrific, tortured voice, as they forcefully jammed the handle of their weapons into her face drawing blood and eye matter. After that, I never saw her there again, at least not in our storage room. I don't know what they did to her. May God protect her. Of course, that wasn't the end of their depravity. Sometimes, they tortured migrants too. 
Occasionally, they let kids watch their parents die in front of them to taunt them, then they let the kids die too. To get something as simple as some bread or rice, you needed to have a lot of money. So we were starved out in the sea for days on end. Eventually, with raging waters and storms threatening to stop our journey short, we arrived in France on the harbour of Toulon. Fishermen encountered us and notified the authorities. Back then, French immigration laws weren't as strict as they are now, so the kids and adults that were caught that day were taken to a centre for migrants. Compared to the squalid conditions on the shipping vessel, this was paradise on earth. Clean water to drink, rooms with lights in them, beds, toilet facilities and meals that were handmade. How fortunate were we that France allowed us on their lands. We can't even begin to describe my gratitude. From that point on, I was blessed by God that I escaped being sent back to Libya. The condition from authorities was that I was to learn fluent French and integrate myself into the French culture, I would be sent back otherwise. I was blessed that I managed these tasks. Some others weren't blessed. Those people who weren't blessed, all their dreams and hopes amounted to naught. All taken away from then with a flick of a finger. But not me, I made it into a new world. Some nights, I wept tears of pain for them. I felt shame that I and a few other children and adults made it, but not all my friends. I still hold a twinge of guilt deep down inside. I'm glad I'm able to recognize it for what it is, guilt. But their failure to reach a new life drives me, keeps me on my toes to not mess up. To work hard and to be somebody worth investing pride in. Soon enough, I got permanent French residence was accepted into a male boarding school in Marseille. And I studied as hard as I could to pass school despite the usual tribulations encountered by being surrounded by guys every day. Not long after I turned 18, I took up the job I work at today, lifeguarding. At Blanc Sables Beach, the most pristine beach in the south of France. Now, I'd like to tell you all of a recurring nightmare I've been having. To be truthful with you, it's not a nightmare really. It's real life. I think it's real, but it all seems dreamlike. Because every Friday morning, I encounter a dead little boy named Mahad. I've worked as a lifeguard in Marseille for close to all my adult life, when I first turned 18. Now I'm 25. And there are things in life which just manages to strike the chord in you to coax out of that tectonic layer of fear stuffed down and repressed in some sort of masculine facade of strength and security. The nightmare of Mahad is one of them. The very first day I turned 21, I checked in to do my shift of lifeguard work as usual. My sensitive and humanistic friend and colleague, Julian, greeted me with a hug and a warm smile. My other close friend and colleague, the gruff but kind-hearted Francis firmly shook my hand and politely wished me a happy birthday. Of course, he sarcastically criticized the poor roster our boss gave us. Every Friday, at the tick of 9 am, we were to arrive on schedule to blink. We were to perform a routine sweep of the beach to ensure nobody was up to no good, and that sands and water intersected at the right distance. Just so not too much water was now sand and not too much sand was now water if you know what I mean? It was the 20th of February when I had turned 21. The year was 2015. As I said, I met my colleagues to perform our sweep of the beach. I was feeling unusually empty inside, despite it being my birthday. You ever get a feeling of just... numbness? Like if you've done a terrible thing and you were about to get caught out in the act but couldn't muster up guilt or shame? Or if you had been betrayed by your friend or partner and you just didn't feel an ounce of care anymore? That's the kind of numbness I felt that morning. I didn't know how else I could describe it. I think God was standing beside me that morning, telling me he would forsake me so, and that the enemy would taunt me in this way. That I would be subjected to the same image, every single Friday morning, for the next four years because what I was about to uncover would tear my world apart. Asunder. We had completed the sweep of the entire eastern stretch of beach before heading over to the west of Blink. Now, the west and the east are decidedly different in visual stimuli. 
The east is unabashedly lush, green and vibrant with high-hanging hill points and shrubbery and trees that don't seem to fit in well with a beach. But the west is more cave-like, low-hanging, near the sea, rigid rocky, white and grey structures and cove entrances holding vast springs of water pepper the west, and make it a dangerous point to access if you wanted to have a swim. Making the west more dangerous was that the ocean was behind it, and if you mucked up and left the sandy dunes or coves, you'd be swept away, just like that. With all that in mind, Francis, Julian and myself all arrived at the west in Blanc Sables Beach. At the bottom of a cove entrance leading to a spring was a little boy dormant on the ground, face upwards. The beach was just behind the boy, so we had to be careful in how we approached him lest we got swept away. It looked like the boy was having a nap on the ground at first, but when we safely approached him, it was clear he wasn't. He was dead. What the heck Francis muttered in disgust. We need to call the police. This poor, little boy. Julian, in shock, said in righteous pain. I didn't know why, but when I first saw the corpse of that little boy, I felt something stir deep within my soul like a tether that had been concealed with an invisible cloak, was now apparent within me. I felt a connection between me and that boy. When the demands of Francis and Julian for police didn't register in my ears, both of them shouted at me. Tay here. Are you okay, brother? Francis said loudly. You kind of spaced out for a second, Tay here. Do you have a suggestion on what to do since the police isn't such a good idea for you? Julian, shaken and unsure of himself, asked. Ah. No, no. Police is a good idea. Just go back to headquarters and call the cops, I'll stick by here and look after the body. You can't be certain of what might be lurking out here. I said this trying to convey an aura of calm and poise, but I sounded anything but. I didn't know why, but I felt like a part of my soul was vested in that child. The image of him laying face up into the sky, brown, glossy eyes shining brilliantly almost brought me to tears. Francis and Julian could see I was becoming emotional, so they decided to give me privacy and head off to find authorities. I'm like a woman, I suppose. That's good. It's good to express what we try to hide. I must have stayed there, seated next to that corpse for over an hour. I was still stirring inside. Like a river being rowed upon by a boat, waves of feeling strode in me. I just felt like I knew that little boy. I don't know why. While I was there, I took the chance to analyze any clues about him, and see if I could find out where he was from, what he was doing out there, how he died, and so on. I tried to do so gently, without leaving DNA or fingerprints on his skin. So I touched him as carefully as possible. The boy looked to be pretty young, maybe no younger than a preteen's age. He was wearing blue shorts and a button-up shirt that was plaid in texture, with a red t-shirt underneath the button-up that said in Arabic, Lion. Furthermore, he had a name tag written on with permanent pen. It simply read, Mahad in Arabic. His name was Mahad. I also found in his shirt pocket a picture of a family. A woman with a long hijab glowing brown eyes and wrinkles on her forehead, a small, mousy little girl with a gap in her teeth, the boy that drowned, and one man that looked to be in his forties or fifties with all that white facial hair. I don't know why, but it rung a bell for me, seeing the man in the picture. It was a face I saw in my dreams, many nights ago. A face that I had tried to forget, but never could forget. A face of misery and pain unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I knew that face. I saw him, I promise. I also found a piece of paper. It, surprisingly, was completely dry. It was a letter, from whom I have no idea. When I read the letter, it made me think of my life, and everything I risked to arrive to France. The letter, translated to English from Arabic with my best efforts, went like this. Dear Mahad I am sorry my son. I hate that our bond has to be across countries. I hate that these monsters enslave us and our friends, and force us to separate for you to live a better life. I know the risks and accept them so that you can see your brother in France. 
Maybe, if the militants that control Libya allow it, we can see each other again. But as it stands, I can only promise you that I'll try my best to look after your mother and sister. I need you to promise me one thing. If God allows, you will find your brother in France, and tell him of his family back home. Tell him that his father misses him. Tell him that you are in his care now, and that he must do his best to ensure you get an education and the make something of yourself. God is watching always, son. Don't forget us and I'll always think of you in my dreams and prayer. When the migrant smugglers take you on their boat, do as they say. Do not ignore their commands, and do not defy them. They are known to be brutal and murderous, and they are people who have little patience for those who are ungrateful. And one more thing, when you track down your brother, show him this letter and the picture. Make sure he understands who you are. Even if he doesn't get it, he will soon. That will be certain, praise be to God for giving me you, son. I love you. Be strong always, and your mission will be complete, if God allows. Love your father. I put the letter down continuing to feel some feelings rise in me. Maybe I was just a little queasy. I was touched by the letter and what the boy went through to get here. His story was just like mine. Maybe that was what drew the connection between us? He was from Libya just like me. Hours I just sat there, staring at the picture, then the little boy, then the picture, then the little boy again. Back and forth like a roundabout in the road that wouldn't stop. Or like a merry-go-round in a playground. Around and around. I was still in a daze, even with cops now arriving with Francis and Julian. It took me a couple minutes to get my head on straight, and the police still asked me if I needed medical attention. I declined, but I could have used it anyway, I felt a bit sick. Soon enough, police called coroners to take the body away. When they arrived, CSIs said that they had quickly determined cause of death. The coroners told Julian, Francis and I that the analysis of the body would be released the following day since the cause of death was clear. As there was no external cuts, wounds or external hemorrhages, they had already determined that the kid drowned. They would also be conducting DNA tests to find any relatives in France, and that would be released on that week's Saturday as well. In a way, I was glad that everything with regards to that kid was wrapped up quickly, but obviously I was wrong to think that. Later that Friday night, I was dead tired. I had a long day of lifeguard work which involved one woman floating out into the ocean unawares, and I was required to swim out and save her life. There was also some incident with a fight breaking out over a man spitting on a woman. Three men fought and one needed a neck brace at the end of the fight. I had to break them up. Beach fights are really rare in France. Oh and well. There were other smaller incidents as well, but my friends and I dealt with it. Typical lifeguard heroics. Anyway, when I got home that evening, I just wanted to sleep early. And sleep early I did, right at 8 p.m., without having a bite of dinner. I'm used to hunger. Hunger keeps you motivated. When you wake up in the morning and you get that growl in your stomach, be it for food or a goal or a chance, hunger is what drives you. Personally speaking, I always slept without eating dinner before a day of lifeguard work since it always ensured I'd have a good feed in the morning, and would be fresh for the following day. I tell you this because not eating was a big mistake. I woke up at 3 a.m., throat dry and stomach grumbling like the inside of a volcano. The moon was out and beams of moonlight shone upon everything visible to the naked eye, except a certain section of my house the garage. I went to the fridge to get a fruit and that's when I noticed movement. The movement instantly drove, waves of fear into my spine. Was it a thief or something? No, it couldn't have been, the size of the intruder was far too small. I took a knife, stepped out into the yard to investigate the garage and then right in front of me was just the black silhouette of something. I couldn't tell if it was about to rob me or have me for dinner but I didn't care. I feigned as much bravery as I could and told the intruder to step out. And show themselves. They did, and I swear to God I nearly jumped out of my own skin. Because standing in front of me, was the little boy who drowned, 
Mahad. I promise you, I was not tripping or having sleep paralysis or anything. This sight was real. Real but incredibly surreal. The figure that stood in front of me, was this adorable little boy with a plaid button-up shirt, blue shorts and the red shirt with lion in Arabic scrawled on it. The name tag was on him with his name on it. I don't know why, but I swear to you, once I read the name tag, all fear in me instantly evaporated, and I grabbed a chair and sat down in front of him. I asked Mahad what he was doing here, what he wanted to tell me. We spoke in fluent Arabic to each other. Tay here, it's me. Your brother, the child spoke in a sweet, soft voice. I found you finally. Now we can talk for the first time ever. You're my brother? How do you know this? I asked him, tears in my eyes. We are one, Tay here. Just look inside yourself. Mahad spoke again, mousy voice cooing. I don't know why but the connection inside me was speaking to me, telling me that this really was my blood brother. The coroner's DNA test was unnecessary. I knew it in my soul. You're my brother. But if this is true, who are my parents? Why'd they abandon me, little brother? I asked him inquisitively. He had answers that he needed to give me. Your parents are Ahmad and Iman Abu Mamoud. Your father, Ahmad. And your mother Iman left you alone at an orphanage after militants overtook most of Libya. They didn't think they could protect you the best they could. After many years, the horror in our country started to go away. Ahmad and Iman had a daughter, Elhan, who they cherished. She died of malnutrition. They grieved their death and pleaded for God to help them in life. They buried her under rubble and stone and never got over her death. They were tormented by their fear and lack of certainty. Soon enough, I was born. And after that Desh took over our country. So when I was six years old, they told me to find you, and tell you that they miss you and want you to forgive them. On the way to here, I died at sea. But I suffered still just trying to get here, just like you my brother. I was locked in a room filled with kids looking for a new life, just as you were. I saw kids tortured. People had boiling water dropped on top of their heads, food was never given to us, we had to use the floor as a toilet. I can tell you all the injustices that happened in those days, but it doesn't matter, we still died. One tiny little tear in the ship's body leaked water inside. No one could escape in time. Everyone was floating in the Mediterranean Sea after 20 minutes maybe. The migrant smugglers, all the children, everyone, drowned. No one survived. And I washed up on the beach where you were. It serves a purpose, Tay here. You need to forgive them. I thought about this for a second. I couldn't forgive them. What they did to me was too much. Why leave me alone? I was theirs. I could have shown them I was worthy of their love. I can't forgive them, Mahad. It's too much. You have to forgive them, Tay here. I need to be free to move on there cannot be bitterness in the family connection. Otherwise I'm stuck in time. I can't move on to the afterlife. Please find it in you, my older brother. Forgiveness is not weak. God forgives us, so we can forgive other people too. Forgiveness is courageous. Forgiveness shows you have moved on from the past. I forgave our father for letting me die at sea too. It wasn't hard. It just takes time, and it takes a choice. If you forgive our parents, we will become one again, and I can be free. The figure started to distort. Right in front of my eyes, I saw the boy start to turn into steam or smoke. He was slowly evaporating before my eyes. If you don't forgive them, I will always be. A reminder. The figure completely evaporated. I just sat there, thinking. Part of me was wondering, did that really just happen? Or am I just crazy? Another part of me held a curious introspection. Why couldn't I forgive my parents? Why couldn't I move on? We were separated by the sea, yet was it not possible that I could move on? No, I never could move on. It was too much. Moonlight was slowly starting to be replaced by sunlight now. I must have sat there talking to him for what seemed like a few minutes, but the time reads 7am. I guess time dilated when I talked with him. 
so that a two-minute conversation became two hours. It seemed that way, at least. You're probably wondering about the coroner's report. Yes, it was confirmed on Saturday that Mahad was my brother. DNA reports stated that there was a 99.45% chance of him being related to me. When my colleagues, Francis and Julian heard about it from me, they looked stunned. Julian sympathetically kissed my cheek and apologized. Francis, ever the stoic one, looked me in the eye and looked down, and then put his hand on my shoulder. I told both of them that I wanted to forget it, and get as much work done as possible. But the apparition I saw the previous night wasn't lying when he said the loop would repeat itself. Because after working every single day until Friday of the following week, my colleagues and I saw the body of Mahad again. Francis and Julian reacted the exact same way they did the previous week, word for word, expression for expression. This only confirmed what Mahad was telling me. It was a time loop. To this day, the time loop remained. Every single Friday, for four years, I saw the body of my little brother near the cove. It repulsed me, made me hate my parents more for deliberately risking my little brother's life so. I thought, did they hate him like they hated me? I started to notice things about Mahad's body and possessions. The little tiny details about how he arrived to France would change every week. Sometimes he's positioned differently. Sometimes he wore different colored clothing. Sometimes his eyes were closed, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes he would bring a little toy car or book. Sometimes he had a few coins on his person. But every time, he had that name tag on his shirt, that read his name. Every time, he had the picture of our family. Every time, he had the letter from our father. Every single time. But recently the other week, I felt my bitter feelings towards my parents subside, like rain clouds floating away to be replaced by the Sunday I don't know how I can explain it. I guess it was just remembering seeing my little brother again that night. And sometimes I saw him in the corner of my eyes, reminding me to let go, to embrace love instead of hatred. I suppose I finally took his words to heart. I looked at the picture of my mother and father, and no longer felt pain and anger, just, sadness. I did love them, because I was related to them by blood. But I was sad that I couldn't let go of that bitter pestilence inside me. Because who am I to hate the people that brought me to this world? I never really hated them. It was the 29th of November, 2019, 9 am, I was greeted at headquarters with a kiss and a hug from Julian and a handshake and pat on the shoulder from Francis. We set off to perform our routine sweep on the beach. We arrived at the same location where the corpse of Ma had laid dormant. But this time there was no corpse. Hey, Julian, Taha. Francis called out. Come check this out, it's a picture. We ran over to Francis holding a picture of people seated around a table. He gave it to me and said, it looks like you in the next to the dude with the white facial hair. A younger you. That's a damned fine coincidence, isn't it? Creepy, Tay here's a time traveler. Julian said in jest. If only he knew. All I could do was smile. Because in the picture was my parents, my dead sister, Mahad and I, smiling. I guess I had truly moved on. And in the corner of my eye, was Mahad waving and laughing at me. I saw him evaporate into a puff of smoke that steadily rose into the blue and white sky. He was ready to join God in paradise. I suppose I learned something very important from all this, forgiveness is not something that is constant. Maybe, people choose to forgive someone who had hurt them out of their own goodness, because they don't hold grudges like unneeded weight. Maybe, people don't forgive other people and they move on. Maybe. People require those that have wronged them to write their mistakes in their eyes to move on. And maybe, forgiveness is something that you have to earn. For me, I learned that forgiveness is a choice you make. It can be achieved inside of ourselves. We just have to choose to bury our bitterness under six feet of soil made of compassion and look forward to a better life. Moving forward and not staying stuck in anger is hard, but it's worth it. 
Time helps with forgiveness, and so does life's lessons. Take them all in, and always have compassion. Yes, I was ready to move on with my life because I had learned what forgiveness truly is. Maybe one day I could see my mom and dad again, and show them that forgiveness in person. Thank God for this. Peace to all of you that read. I hope you find it in your heart to forgive someone. Hey Dreamland Babies, I would just like to ask you to consider a donation or to become an Patreon. If you can't afford it right now but still love the Dreamlands you pick from the orchard, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you Bunchies Munchies.